thanks to the organizers for uh, organizing this wonderful conference and also giving me the chance to share with you some things that things that interest me a bit and I'm going to talk about the Sinaev Zeldovich effect from quasar feedback so kind of related to what uh, Tuhin spoke previously and I'm going to start with this uh, M sigma relation which I'm sure at least several of you have seen this is sorry this is telling us that sorry extremely sorry okay so what we are seeing in this plot is that the masses of the central supermassive black holes in galaxies is correlated with the velocity dispersion of large scale gas and stars in the galaxy now why is this this was seen like 15 years back and why is this interesting it's interesting because the supermassive black hole which is only a solar system scale thing sitting inside the center of the galaxy is some way talking to the gas and stars which are tens of kiloparsec away from it so the immediate understanding was that there must be some connection some communication going on between the central supermassive black hole and the large scale gas and star and then a, an answer that was provided uh, to these kinds of correlations and other studies is something that was termed in the literature as black hole feedback which says that okay what if this this black hole just injects energy and particles into the intergalactic intercluster medium and these were the pioneering observations which sort of started in the Chandra era and what you see here is actually an HST image of a galaxy cluster and in blue we have the X-ray map of the cluster and the red are the famous, this is a VLA radio image, and you do see these jets, large scale radio jets coming uh, from the central supermassive black hole, and that is pushing the gas and changing the, the, the concentration, the distribution of gas. So these were seen uh, at that time in massive clusters, and also till date they have been seen in galaxy groups too. So I think the number of systems where uh, these kind of things have been observed, combining groups and clusters should be a few hundreds, okay? But we were talking about the M sigma relation, which is uh, related to like galaxies. This is galaxies of all types. So if it's so ubiquitous, then the question comes that are there ways other than, you know, cluster systems and other observational probes with which we can uh, study this effect or think about this problem? And one of the proposal was the Sinaev Zeldovich effect to study AGN or black hole feedback. And the idea was that, okay, uh, if the Sinaev Zeldovich effect be seen as an effective mechanism to study the accumulations of hot gas in the universe, then what about seeing them in the case of quasar feedback where we do have hot gas? And these were the people like 20 years back or 15, 20 years back who, who, who proposed this idea, but that was shelved. And then, uh, this is also a very old plot, 12 years old, this is my first paper as a PhD student, and this was back in 2006, 2007, when all these Archimedes scale CMB experiments were under commission, so they were coming online, and one of the, one of the issues that uh, I was worried in my, during my PhD years is that how about using the Archimedes CMB experiments as probes to detect hot, the, the, the accumulations of hot gas, that is SC effect or small scale SC effect uh, from, from systems other than clusters because clusters have this majority of SC signal but things like quasar feedback and many other signals like you know, galactic winds and everything that were proposed at that time. So that was one of the goal. The second goal was that since these ACT or SPT like experiment, this, uh, these Archimedes scale, uh, Archimedes resolution experiments were targeted toward uh, detecting clusters. So one of the goal was to see that will these small scale effects have come as, no, you know, uh, how much noise can they add to your uh, your, your detection of clusters via the sunayev zeldovich effect. And then at that time, of course, uh, no, no observation existed of the SC effect from AGN feedback or for, for that matter, any other small scale SC. And so we sort of took a very 
uh, simple model. It was simple with many parameters. And the fun is that when you don't have observations, you can write down anything in theory and make a prediction. Uh, life becomes hard when you have observations, and I'll tell you why. So this was essentially the power spectrum. Uh, this is uh, this the solid line is what we predicted from the Quasar is the effect that's going to contribute to the CMB power spectrum. And this z equal to 2.5 and 3.0. These are actually three parameters because in our model we had like instantaneous. Uh, ejection of energy at a given initial redshift. So all the quasars sitting in all dark matter halos just inject at a given time. And there were other free parameters also based on which the, the amplitude of the signal and also the peaks. Well, the peaks didn't were not so sensitive. This peak actually is typically the scale of the bubble that the, the peak in the power spectrum is typically the scale of the bubble of the, you know, the outflow that's going out. Now from the power spectrum, we did one more interesting thing. So apart from the ACT and SPT-like experiments, we did one more interesting thing, which was actually thinking of direct detection of these signals. Because as you saw that the power spectrum peak was at a very high L value. This was like typically tens of arc second uh, and below that. We actually thought about ALMA, which was also under commission at that time. What about a direct imaging of a quasar? And we predicted, we said at that time, whatever sensitivity uh, prescription was available for ALMA, based on that, what we predicted is that if we can go to a compact configuration of ALMA, because you can see that these resolutions are very large for a radio interferometer, but it's a compact configuration. And the sensitivity level could reach few microkelvin or tens of microkelvin, which was the predicted signal coming from SC effect. And then, uh, this, so these were the ideas. This is like, uh, that first is, of course, we did the power spectrum, and then we have the direct observations. And we also had another proposal that even if we don't resolve the sources, what about doing a stacking analysis with the, available, with the CMB maps, like the ones that were coming or ones that were existing, and then do a cross correlation between uh, squares from optical survey quasars like Sloan, and you look at CMB maps. So at the time, I was an ardent graduate student, and I had to finish my thesis. So I presented this work in one of the ACT workshops. I'm so glad, glad that Lyman is sitting there. And this was a suggestion by David Spargle that even if it is, it is very far, far-fetched, because we had W map at that time, fantastic things already came out of WMAP. Can we try this analysis with WMAP? And I was bold enough with my collaborator, Shirley Ho, who was also a graduate student at that time. And we tried to do a stacking analysis of the Sloan quasars uh, in the WMAP uh, maps. And this is a terrible plot. Uh, so this is basically three WMAP frequencies, 41, 61, and 90 gigahertz. And particularly in the 41 gigahertz, we did detect a decrement when we did the stacking analysis. However, who knows why that decrement? And this spectral feat that you are seeing here, this was actually SZ plus dust. If we did only SZ, it was not available. There are also many other systematic effects. But there were two things that came out from that analysis. First, there was a decrement. Second, when we randomized the position of the quasars in the sky and reanalyzed for many, 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 many random realizations, we could not find. It was totally a null result. So somehow, we report a decrement and show that quasars were correlated with the temperature pixels in WMAP. Is it SZ effect? We don't know. The title of the paper was the tentative detection. And then years passed. Nothing much happened until the Planck, SPT, and ACT maps came in. And then many of these groups, they actually did uh, the cross-correlation detections, so this is Planck and SDSS, Planck and Voss, ACT and, and Sloan and Herschel. So these groups actually did the stacking analysis technique, the cross-correlation technique. Not exactly what we did, but you know, in that line. And some of the groups actually said that they do detect quasar feedback because there is an enhanced signal when you include the quasars above what you expect from galaxy clusters. But by that time, one important issue came up, and that is when we predict the signal, 
there was something in the signal which is essentially the host halos of quasars. So the, when it, because SZ is a line of sight integral, as uh, Tuhin said. So if there are, what is the environment of the quasar actually matters a lot. Is it sitting in a group environment or an isolated galaxy or a cluster? That matters because the gas in the virialized halo can also contribute to the SD signal. And so a knowledge of the halo occupation distribution of quasars became essential. And with my student, Dhruva Dattu Choudhury, what we showed, this is a complicated plot. So what we showed, just look at these three squares. These two purple data points and this yellow data point, these three are detections from Rouen et al. and Verdier et al. And Rouen had two stacks of quasars, one with typically median redshift one and the other with median redshift two. All the other data points are essentially the theoretical prediction of SZ that you would get assuming some gas model and some halo occupation, quasar halo occupation distribution model. So the punchline of this talk is that if I look at the high redshift data, yes, the detections seem to be above the theoretical predictions that we get when we input the HOD and the gas model. But at low redshift, it is hard to say that if it is indeed an enhancement or it's the stacking that's, that's the, it's the signal that's coming from the host halos of quasars. Also, there is another caveat in this plot, and that is that when we did this HOD, these HODs are all independent of redshift. I'll be done, sorry, independent of redshift. And as a result, we did not have redshift evolution in the HOD. So that is also a caveat that was not considered. And then came this fantastic paper uh, uh, by my colleagues at NRAO. Uh, this is Mark Lacey and collaborators who actually did an ALMA observation I'll just, because I don't have time, I'll just show the figure and tell you what was done. So what they did is they looked at this field, they chose a radio quiet, very bright radio quiet quasar, and looked at it 130 gigahertz in ALMA, and also looked at the same field in HST. J HST was archival, they did not look at HST, but Gemini and, um, and uh, 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 sorry, Gemini and, huh? Spitza, sorry, Gemini and Spitza. And what they found was that, you know, there is a, this is a lot of detailed interferometry, but after tapering, they did find that with the HST spectroscopy and imaging, they could find that there was outflows coming from the quasars, number one. And after the tapering, they did detect about a 37 microkelvin, like a brightness temperature difference. This is minus 37 microkelvin, typically a 3.5 sigma peak. Now I will, now the interpretation of that, that why is this the effect first? And second, if it says the effect, can we constrain the parameters of feedback? That is still, uh, we, have, we use some model to do it, but that needs careful consideration. And so I'll conclude my talk saying that we do have the stacking analysis. Uh, SZ from Quasar is interesting, both from galaxy evolution perspective and cosmology perspective. And we have stacking and we have direct detection, at least of this, but this is only one object. I was speaking with Toby Marriage and he said that they are also looking for some sources in ALMA to do a direct detection. But both the detections still need things like understanding the HOD or understanding the physical feedback model itself to put more robust constraint. And I would ask all of you to stay tuned. Thank you very much.